Hey. I'm the Fonz. I, yeah, I thought you were. <laughs> hey, hey, welcome to the sitcom Archive Deep Dive Overdrive, or Sato for short, for another episode, Deep Dive in Faulty Towers. I'm Ex Benedict. Indeed. My name's Alison Barton-Simmons. We're deep diving Faulty Towers, or on the second episode of Series 2, which is called The Psychiatrist. This is a watch-along podcast, so you can watch the episodes and then join us to deep dive each episode one after the other. Um, you can watch along on Daily Motion. You can watch on iPlayer on the BBC in the UK, or a good old DVD if you've got that to hand. Um, and I think that, I think there are episodes on YouTube as well. Yeah, there's, it's everywhere basically, so you should be able to find it. You don't really have yeah. to watch it; just listen to us dissect it anyway. If if that's enough for you. Yeah. But they're always good to revisit. This one's a really long one, isn't it, Al? It was, yes. Um, and lots of slapsticky, misunderstanding nonsense that the programme is absolutely well known for. It's weird. It was one of my favourites, as I recall, watching them on VHS when I was a kid. But Really? Now, it was just a bit too much. It was just too frenetic, too, too much misunderstanding, too incredulous. Yep. But, I mean, you know, I still enjoyed it, but it was just, whoa, this is a bit... Far fetched. <laughs> there was yeah, there was lots of manic manic behaviour, and I did find that um, I warmed to Sybil a little bit in this episode. Ah, well, exactly what I've got written down here. But really. Before we get too far into this, um, before mm. we, before we get started, we did uh, challenge each other to write some limericks about either the cast or the characters in Faulty Towers, didn't we? We we did, and yeah, I I once I'd started, I couldn't stop. I I. Just wrote loads. Did you? Because I struggled. I'm not showing off. Last time we did two or three each when we were doing The Good Life. But I really struggled. Really? You go and then I'll go. I think I've got okay. two that are passable. Okay. <laughs> Maybe one and a half. Right, well, I'm, I'm going to start with Sybil. There was a hotelier named Sybil whose quest was to nitpick and quibble. Rather than leave well alone, she continued to drone and made Basil uptight and a wibble. <laughs> That's more or less exactly the same as I've got. Just, just, <laughs> just the third and fourth line were different. There once was a bad lax called Sybil with a husband. She often would quibble, lacking intercourse. He preferred to read Jaws. <laughs> oh, that's fucking <laughs> awful! She had sent the poor bastard quite wibble. Oh, brilliant! Because I, not... I kept thinking, is wibble a thing? And then I googled it, and I think it, is it like a blackadder thing? It's definitely a blackadder thing. Yeah, he stuck things up his nose and did and wibble. Yeah, so. I thought a, a wibble was um, a good way to describe it. Was it was appropriate for a British sitcom podcast. Indeed. To be to crowbar in a uh, Blackadder reference, I think. What's your second one? Okay. The once was a tall man named Faulty, whose movements were manic and jolty. He was so tightly wound that any loud sound left him angry and notoriously salty. Oh, very good. I like that one. Yeah, you're putting me to shame. Mine is shit. Yeah, this is my second one. There was a young waitress named Polly, and covering for Basil was her folly. She'd make excuses and lie, Christ only knows why, because Basil was just off his trolley. Mine, again, is very, is very similar. Is we've, not, we've not written these together. No. The once was a cute maid named Polly, who worked for a battle axe and Wally. Her dream was to draw, not lay out the law, while refereeing the continuous folly. Oh, that was good. Yeah, very good. I struggle. Go on, what else have you got then? The once was an old man named Major <laughs> who encouraged poor Basil to wager some cash on a horse and it came in, of course, but the Major forgot the daft racist bastard. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Well done. <laughs> I actually tried one about the Major and it was... Okay. Oh, shall I read it anyway? Yeah, I couldn't rhyme it, so that's why it ended the way it did. Yeah, mine's... The once was an old boy, the Major, who with a shotgun was clearly a danger. When he spotted a rat, he said, fancy that, and shot the stone dead, I'll wager. <laughs> it's <laughs> fucking awful, isn't it? I think I might cut that out, actually. I'm ashamed of it. I've got one about Manuel. Oh, yeah, go on. Manuel was a small man from Spain who worked hard and didn't complain. He got smashed with a pot and set fire to a lot. Manuel, was it worth all the pain? Oh, that's deep. It is, isn't it? Yeah. And ended on a question. Um, a guest who will call Mrs R 
couldn't hear much if near or if far. She shouted, what, what? And was angry a lot. It made poor Basil head for the bar. Yep, very good. And my last one. Yeah. O'Reilly was bad at his work and Sybil thought he was a jerk. He was such a disgrace, so she smashed in his face with a brolly for being a burk. Very good. I like the I like the fact that we've managed to get some peripheral characters in there. I don't know why O'Reilly came to mind. <laughs> well, I mean, Basil and Sybil are not easy rhymes. No, as we know, he's just he's just contrarian, and he can't even anagram John Cleese's name for fuck's sake. Can he? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh well. Okay, let's get stuck into this episode, shall we? Yes, let's do that. <laughs> So at the beginning of this one, we've got uh, our first view of the urchin boy, the newspaper delivery fella, changing the sign there and then, because we don't usually see him up to no good, do we? Oh, I don't know if I saw that. Yeah, he was was actually changing the the letters at the start to make the words watery fowls. I will honestly say, I don't remember seeing that. You weren't watching it in reverse, were you? Is it a Mandela effect, this, that it didn't really happen and you've just been imagining it? I'm pretty sure it happened. Yeah. Unless you watched like a truncated version of it. I don't remember the kid doing it. Mm. But it was War Three Fowls, which isn't a perfect anagram. It was. Because some of the letters have been dropped there, I think. Yes. Probably in his pocket. With some chewits. We can't all be anagram masters. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. As, as you well know. <laughs> yeah, I fucking do, yeah. Very busy reception again, just like last week, wasn't it? It was lots of milling about, and both Sybil and Basil on the telephone. At the same time, stood right next to each yeah. other on their two separate God. landlines. I find it quite amusing yeah. that they've both got separate lines, because she's always on the phone to Audrey, so she must need her own dedicated line. It's just the Audrey hotline, that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like so the one... shouting, oh, I know, down. <laughs> like the one um, Rod Hull had in his emu, in his, in his windmill. <laughs> in his emu! <laughs> He did, that's what it is. It's the Audrey hotline in the pink windmill. <laughs> Sybil's on the phone to Audrey and she's giving it the usual, oh dear, and all this sort of nonsense. And Basil, Basil simultaneously is on a phone call, which it becomes apparent that he's phoning the speaking clock for reasons unexplained. Yeah, yeah but he's chattering away. To He said it's engaged, but he's still busy talking away. So He must have called the operator. In the days yeah. when that was something you would do. Mm. And then we see um, Mr. Johnson, this sort of, um, I don't know, what. how would you describe Mr. Johnson? It's sort of like cross between Kirk from Dear John and Robin Asquith, yes. facially. Yes, yeah. He did look like Robin Asquith quite a bit, but the, yeah, the clothes were definitely... Awful. Kirk. <laughs> Awful, yeah, but Kirk from um, Dear John, definitely, with the open, open neck shirt and medallions and... Which we'll talk about further in fashion, fashion corner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I thought he looked like a fucking idiot. Um, he had all this sort of chest hair on display, and Sybil was fawning all over him, and she was clearly quite taken with him, wasn't she? She was obsessed. Yeah, obsessed by him. Basil sort of had a little dig about him being a monkey, and went into the went into his back office and sort of smirked to himself, and uh, he could hear Sybil's laughter and. I think Mr. Johnson's telling a joke to which the punchline is pretentious, moi. And, and you kept hearing this throughout the episode. You kept hearing the punchline of the joke just coming out of different rooms randomly. It, obviously, it was the funniest joke the hotel has ever heard. I mean, I wonder if you can Google and get the actual full context of that joke, if it is a real joke, or if it's like Peter Kay's, you know, ping pong balls. I said King Kong's okay. balls. <laughs> I wonder. Shall I Google it right now? Have a look, have a look. Yeah, go on. Mr Johnson did think he was very funny, though. He thought he was like the, the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah, he loved himself, didn't he? Mm. Oh, fuck, I'm looking it up on, on Bing. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to help, is it? Now, every result for pretentious moi is just referencing Faulty Towers without giving you oh, any context to the full not joke. Not with the full joke. Oh, what a shame. Oh, oh, oh hold on, hold on, hold on.
No. <laughs> no, it's not there. <laughs> no, sorry. I built false hope there, didn't I? I might leave that long pause in just for tension. <laughs> yes. So Sybil is trying to make Basil jealous, I I believe, in in my opinion. I think anyway. so. Because she's yeah. um, making remarks about how attractive and easy and amusing and charming this man is. Yeah. Which I, I didn't think he was any of those things, but there you go. In, in, the, in the sort of context of the 70s, perhaps, yeah, perhaps that's what virile young men, that's mm. what women, that's what women fancied, perhaps. Well, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? And Sybil clearly mm. gets her rocks off to this kind of character. Um yeah. But- but Basil, he makes a reference to saying that uh, that type would wear a dog turd around its neck if it was made of gold, which I thought was a great line. <laughs> In amongst this sort of like constant bickering that we often see between Sybil and Basil, Mr. and Mrs. Abbott arrive to check in. Yes, the doctors, the doctors Abbott. Incidentally, the guy who plays Mr. Johnson, Nicky Henson, was at one time married to Una Stubbs, which I think you clocked as well, didn't you? I did. She's obviously in Faulty Towers later on, isn't she? As a guest, she is, and it it was it was. I went through it like down a little bit of a rabbit hole to to, to find that out, and I, I quite like it when we get things that just come back together in in the podcast of things mm. that we've talked about in the past. So yeah, good old Eunice Stubbs. I wonder if he ever was a guest on. Give us a clue. I don't remember his name being in the sing song title. With Mr. Johnson <laughs> and his hairy chest. Basil suddenly becomes very interested anyway in Mr. and Mrs. Abbott as soon as he realises that they're doctors. Prior to that, he wasn't particularly asked, but then this whole snobbery comes to the fore and he suddenly wants to be their best friend. Yeah, once he knows that there's somebody that's worth having at the hotel, hmm. like two doctors. Like we said last week about the, the doctor um, in the episode, it's someone that was that was given like specialist treatment almost and you, you were to trust them and you were to um, obey them and do, do as you were told. And so straight away... Basil is fawning over this couple because he thinks that the, this is the clientele that he wants at, at Faulty Towers, definitely. I tell you what, it's not always a good idea to do what your doctor tells you to the letter of the law. Okay. Because it's got me in trouble before before now. Have I told you this story about how they told me, uh, you know, in my prostate trouble, they told me yeah. I, it was important to clean out the pipes. Have I told you this? I don't think you have. They said uh, you need to make sure, you know, that you regularly yes. s- sort yourself out. Mm-hmm. Oh, so I'm, you know, I'm untriggerable these days. I mean, I've got, <laughs> I've got no fucking proclivity towards sorting myself out. So right. I just don't think to. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm not. I'm going to forget. So I set myself a little reminder on my phone. Right. And um, a weekly reminder, I think it was. You know, just to. But it, my phone syncs with my Google Calendar, and I, I just so happened to be training a lady in how to use her new website that I built for her, and she sat right next to me in the little thing come up on the screen saying bing bong wank self off <laughs> <laughs> it was rather embarrassing i don't think she noticed fortunately because i just dismissed it <laughs> before she it's a true story honestly i'm not making this up <laughs> yeah but i did bring it to a close quite quickly after that out of embarrassment and she might have thought maybe i was in a rush to go and attend to business go and do it she's like yeah. shit i've got to get i've got to get on it <laughs> but yeah just be careful when you're listening to your doctor, is all I'm saying. Anyway. Yes. By the by. Um, <laughs> did you notice Pampas Grass now has, now has moved into the centre of the set? I did notice that, yes. Mm. It's been shuffled around. Maybe mm. to catch the eye of the abbots, perhaps. Maybe that is um, that is definitely the clientele that the faulties are going for. Do you know what? Actually, that's what I should have done. I should have just got some Pampas Grass and put it put it somewhere in the room that reminded me weekly to sort myself out. Exactly. I would have had the embarrassment. And set your alarm to like a brass tone noise so that it just goes... Mah. Perfect. <laughs> then you go, oh, I know what I need to do. It's not exactly arousing though, is it? The brass tone noise. <laughs> God. <laughs> As you get your jollies, brass tone. Bloody hell. <laughs> no, so um, Mr. Johnson's talking to Sybil about accommodating his mother. And, and Sybil's just still lasciviously kind of just leching over the guy. as, as uh, Yeah. But this mother stuff is just clearly exposition for later, isn't it? He wants his mother to come and stay. Yes. She is really annoying while he's on the phone. He's trying to have a phone call and she's just sort of blathering on down his ear all, isn't she? She is moaning about her own mother. 
and just mithering him like over his shoulder and you can tell by his face that he's like just leave me alone i'm trying to make a phone call here i think he's quite glad when basil shows back up having shown the psychiatrist upstairs the yeah. abbots not that he knows the psychiatrist at this point um and and basil's praising the looks of mrs abbott isn't he i think he's he is. tit for tat really he's just sort of um and it's not the only tit in this show it's not he's he's basically just sort of getting his own back on sybil for being flirtatious mm. with Mr. Johnson. Yeah, he tells her that um, he likes Mrs. Abbott's clothes and that that's how Sybil should dress more. Yeah, which is not a very nice thing to say or do, is it? No, it's not. No. 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 How she doesn't batter him at that stage, I don't know. She's quite she's quite calm, really. The Abbots are immediately downstairs. They're, they're inquiring after... A, they've just checked in and they've come back downstairs. They're inquiring after a guide to Torquay, a tourist guide to Torquay. And, and Mr. Johnson, who's on the phone, he actually has one, which he, he lends to them and re- makes a remark about it being the world's shortest book, which actually is quite rude in front of a couple of talky residents in Basel and It Sibyl, is really, it? yeah, considering you've gone there for a, for a trip. It's quite an odd, an odd mm. take, really, isn't it? Yeah, he's, he's uh, Basil just takes, that gets his back up. It doesn't take much, of course, and he just starts making a lot of very passive-aggressive remarks. Mm. Uh, when when they're all out of the way, though, Sybil makes an insightful and entirely valid remark to Basil that she says, I'm, I'm sick of you. You never get it right. You're either crawling all over them, licking their boots or spitting poison at them like some benzamine puff adder. And that is, yeah, very relevant. And we've said this all along, haven't we, that he, he, he does when he's when he sort of spots someone that he thinks is appropriate. He's all over him like a rash. Hmm. He's one extreme or the other, isn't he? Yeah, and it and it always seems to go wrong. He can never do that. He never does the fawning where it all works out in his favour. It ends up where he just looks like a crazy person at the end. Later at dinner, Basil is um, sycophantically offering the Doctor a drink on the house, exactly as you're saying. He's gone so over the top that it just creeps the abbot out. Yeah. I mean, they'll, they'll yeah. accept a free drink, <laughs> you know, don't get me wrong. But Absolutely. they're clearly thinking, what's with this guy? And uh, they're sort of chatting, both Basil and Sybil are sort of quite happily chatting with the, with the abbots and mm. Basil makes reference to he, he actually could have been a surgeon which I think John Cleese was studying to be a surgeon wasn't he? Was he? What when he was in was he in Footlights was he at Cambridge? Uh, was he Oxford? I don't know but he, anyway uh, that obviously never happened but um, I thought it was quite a good line from Sybil where she said tree surgeon Yeah <laughs> <laughs> He had to give it up because he couldn't stand the sight of Sa <laughs> did like that and this is where it comes out that Mrs. Abbott is a paediatrician and Mr. Abbott is a psychiatrist. They are a power couple, aren't they? Yeah, they are a bit. Yeah, I bet Faulty just yeah thought that he's, um, he's quid in here. Now, if John Howard Davis was still directing this, we might have had a brass tone at this point, might not we? Because the psychiatrist thing... I think that would have been a perfect... Yeah, perfect point. Because, yeah, you, that is definitely a... A klaxon. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? It's like the ultimate in letting you know... That there is something afoot here. Yeah, something's the, wrong, yeah. something's awry. Something, something's going to happen. Uh, Basil's, you know, he's, he's on the back foot straight away as soon as he realises that this guy's a psychiatrist. He's in the kitchen in full paranoia mode. God, yeah. He beckons Sybil in and labours the point to it, saying, you know, take it easy, keep your distance, remember who you are. Don't tell them about yourself. Yeah, yeah, he keeps saying take it easy. And then Basil... Not Basil, uh, Jacko the chef. What's his name? Terry. <laughs> Terry. Jacko. Yes. Well, he just—he looks like Jacko. He does, yeah. He looks—he looks like the type of guy that Jerry Ledbetter hangs out with at Chelsea, but not on yeah, the avenue. Yeah, but not you know anywhere I mean? else. Yeah, they don't spend any time together anywhere else. Yeah, I agree. It, it rocks up on the terraces, and and Jacko says, "Watch you, Jerry." <laughs> oi, oi. Oi, oi. Basil sort of has a, a bit of a go at, at Jacko, doesn't it, <laughs> Terry? Um, yeah. He's saying, you don't take it easy. I pay you to tell me not to take it easy. And he's just, sort of, he's just getting himself into a tear straight away. Yes, yeah, and, he is. And, and what I quite, sort of quite liked in this scene, Sybil's quite sympathetic to Basil initially. She's yeah. trying to calm him. and I mean, she's laughing at him, but she's sort of saying, you know, don't worry. And sort of a nice side yeah. to their marriage that you see briefly. Yeah, yeah. The issue is that he straight away assumes that all psychiatrists are obsessed with sex. Yes. And yeah. he's obviously panicking about being asked about his sex life. 
so much so that he just spills out all this nonsense mm. in the next scene, and he really, he really is struggling. He, he's struggling to sort of just, 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 just take the couple. They're, they're on the holidays. They just want to come away on holiday, have a nice time away from work. They're not, they're, they're not there to put you under the spotlight. But he doesn't get that. No, well, he mistakenly thinks that when they ask him how often he and his wife manage it, yeah, that they're talking about making the two bat beast, where in fact they're talking about having a having a trip to Scotland or something. I think. Yeah, just a holiday. How many times do you manage to get away? Yeah, um, I think sh- shortly after this, Sybil explains it to Basil, and he's sort of, oh, what have I done? You know, that's one of those, yeah, sort of realisation moments that in real life would make you more cautious moving forward. <laughs> yeah, but he wants to sort it. He wants to go in there and put them straight. Yeah, yeah, he chases them. Up. Oh, They're on their way out gets... and he chases them, doesn't he, to explain. Oh, it gets worse. <sighs> Did you notice as as the Abbots are walking out for their evening stroll, mm. they changed the backlighting outside to show that it was dusk and it looked so fake. Yes, it did. I thought, oh, that looks pretty. But yeah. yes, it just looks like someone's painted it. Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Good morning, Major. Very well, thank you. <laughs> so with the abbots out the door, probably thinking, who's this nutter? Mm-hmm. Basil returns to reception where there's a young Australian lady checking in. There is Rayleigh Miles. Miss Rayleigh Miles. Oh, is there. that her name? I didn't catch it, right? Yeah. I don't think she is Australian. She's just doing an accent, isn't she? Yes, it's she It's not very convincing. Actress Lu- Luanne Peters. She's quite busty. She is. And Basil's immediately sort of staring down her top, isn't he? Drawn to them. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's very obvious that he's, he's trying to get a copper look. There's a bit of pantomime in the background at this point because Mr Johnson is trying to sneak in his bit of cramp it, isn't he? Yeah, bit of, bit of, yeah, bit of stuff. It was a bit on the buses stroke. Carry on. It, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. But, uh, yeah, so... We get the first view of the upstairs that we've had for a while, actually, as as Mr. Johnson just about sneaks the girl into his room as Faulty shows the Australian chick, Rayen. What is it? Yeah. Um, Raylene. Raylene, up to her, up to her room. And he, he shows her all the way into the room, and he, he's sort of showing her what's what, and he realises the light switch isn't working in her room, which leads to that sort of infamous groping scene where he is testing it through the doorway while she's stretching right up against the wall and he's yeah. just i mean <laughs> when he's when he's tweaking I'm, I'm miming it now not that anyone can see but when he's tweaking <laughs> tweaking what's clearly a nipple and not a light switch yeah you would immediately recognize it as thus wouldn't you You'd, and stop yeah <laughs> but he doesn't that's not a light switch i'll i'll let that go because i've obviously just grabbed a boob yeah but no he, he carries on he carries on just <laughs> just groping it. her yeah at the same time sybil walks in and sees all this of course of course she does. And Sybil doesn't believe Basil's excuse, whereas, weirdly, the Australian girl is very understanding. She is, isn't she? Very she understanding. Is. Not for, and it, this isn't the last time. She's just ridiculously reasonable. This 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 lady. Mm. My issue. Oh, what I said before as well about not um, about warming to Sybil in this episode. It was this scene that made me warm to her because she, while she was cross with Basil, mm. she didn't berate the girl for having her boobs in the way when he was trying to sort the light switch. She sort of sides with, with the girl and says, I know I know that it's not you, it's him. He's an absolute imbecile. All the way through, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah she never blames the woman for it, which I thought that's, that's a good thing. She sort of keeps it professional, really, Sybil, doesn't she? She'd yes. probably run a very smooth operation without Basil for two reasons. He wouldn't be there ruining yeah. everything, but also she'd have to pull her socks up and do some fucking work, wouldn't she? She would. She would. So, yeah, so yeah, so th- this episode, did, yeah, it did it did soften Sybil for me. Basil's trying to sort of make his excuses to Sybil in, in the hallway upstairs, and Sybil doesn't believe Basil at all. Mm. Walking away, though, Basil hears Mr Johnson cracking his pretentious joke again. I know, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> pretentious, moi. And then there was a girl giggling, but it wasn't it wasn't naturally enough so he cracks the joke pretentious moi and there's about two second pause and then she laughs. Maybe, maybe it's a thinker. Maybe it's something you have to ponder on. We'll never know. We've not heard the joke. We don't know. Yeah, it might it be a be real a, cerebral yeah. gag. This has got Basil's goat because he has a rule about no guests of the um, indeed opposite persuasion, sexual yeah. persuasion, after 10pm. 
Um, so he, he he bumps into Mr. Johnson in the corridor and he stipulates this. He reminds him of it. And Mr. Johnson just says, oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Miss Miss Tibbs and Miss Gatsby make a brief appearance there, thinking, thinking that the, the psychiatrist is there for the major. <laughs> Come for the major. Yeah, that made me laugh. Basil lets himself into the room next door to Mr. Johnson. Yes. In order to eavesdrop through the wall so he can hear this, to hear what's going on because he thinks he's yeah. he's got a girl in there. But it, this is the Abbot's room and they return immediately and he's like faking tapping the wall as if... Checking the wall, oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a famous outtake actually from this episode where he's doing it and the wall's shaking so much. Oh, no. <laughs> Mr. Johnson's ordered some champagne. And Basil tries to actually burst in with this champagne in order to catch that him was funny. in flagrante. Was funny. But of course, mm. the door's locked, isn't it? Yes. So he just ends up just pouring all the champagne all over himself. Yeah. Mr. Johnson comes out to see what the kerfuffle's about, and he's busy beating up Manuel as if it's poor Manuel's fault. Yeah, Manuel gets hit with a tray. He calls him a Dago bird brain. A little bit of mild xenophobia there. The Major appears at this point, and like the ladies and Basil, he's also bothered by the presence of this of this psychiatrist. <laughs> yeah, he's got a bit of a panic on, hasn't he, that he's going to be taken away. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that you would think that only Basil would draw the conclusion that all well, the psychiatrists are reading everything into us, but these these three older generation characters are also mm-hmm. quite discombobulated by, by the psychiatrist's presence, aren't they? Yeah. Mm. So, so Manuel brings the second bottle, and this time... We see inside the room as Mr. Johnson's uh, lovely bit of crampet goes and hides in the uh, in the wardrobe as Basil knocks and then brings in the champagne. Yes. So, I mean, Basil's suspicious, but he can't prove anything. He, he's not going to go rummaging through the wardrobe, is he? No, but he's, he's, he's got his suspicions. And he actually pours out the guy's cigarettes into his hand, doesn't he? Which is minging. Yeah. And takes them out into the corridor. As he shuts the door, he starts inspecting them one by one. What's, what's that for? Why would you do that? Lipstick, what the, maybe. What was the point? Ah, oh, okay. I mean, he's just checking checking out butts. Just, just yeah, <laughs> just for any... Right, okay, yeah. Mr. Abbott, Dr. Abbott, is watching him do this, which is obviously adding to the what's wrong with this guy vibe. That's... He's, yeah, his, his list of, <laughs> of things. Yeah, his list, list of idiosyncrasies and peculiarities, <laughs> which Basil thinks... The guy is, is forming conclusions about, presumably, about his sexual deviancy. Yeah, I'm sure it all it all goes back to that, I'm sure. <laughs> Most ludicrously, though, next, Basil lets himself into the Australian lady's room to eavesdrop yes. through her wall while she's asleep on the bed. Oh, my God. How's he not got shut down? I mean, how, how's he not on a list? <laughs> yeah, he should be signing a register somewhere, shouldn't he? Again, though, she's really understanding. She's like, oh, he was just checking the walls. Basil's obsessed, though, and he really wants to catch Mr. Johnson with this with this girl. So next thing you know, he's outside with a ladder that, Ma- oh, that Manuel's propped up against the exterior of the building in order to catch yeah. Mr. Johnson and his girl through the window. And it, yeah. it, it's probably telegraphed that you see him going up the up the ladder, yeah. and then it's sort of it's cleverly shot because you see uh, Mr. Johnson canoodling with his girl. In, inside, with, and you see the window. Yes. So you think Basil's yeah. about to appear at that window, and you see Basil going yeah. up the ladder. You see the, Mr. Johnson canoodling, and you're back to the window, and you just see Basil's face appear. But as it as it pans away, it's clear that it's the Abbot's room that he's looking into. <laughs> yeah, and she's yeah. in a state of partial undress. <laughs> yeah, she's like dressed up in a girdle. I love the way they're so calm about it, though. They just sort of look at him. Oh yeah, they just look at him. Yeah, this did have vibes of um, Confessions of a Window Cleaner, I must admit. This yeah, scene. the whole thing was with, with that Robin Asquith yeah. looking motherfucker as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I like the fact that Basil tries to cover for it by doing his little tapping thing on the Do window. The tapping on the window! <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. And the window, did you notice the window, sh- like the glass just moving completely as he was doing it? I didn't. It? I can imagine. So Manuel isn't supporting the ladder. It's all Manuel's fault again. He's just stood right by the ladder. And it, Manuel's <laughs> face as he watches the ladder tip backwards. Tip backwards, And then ba- yeah. Basil's on the on the lawn. I mean, that could have killed him, couldn't it, in real life? A fall like that. Yeah. Or put him in a wheelchair for life or something. But there's no reference to it. He just gets up. He gets up and, and it's all all right. Yeah, well, while he's recu- recuperating, Manuel's rushed inside to get Sybil because he, yeah. he's, he is worried that, that Basil's hurt badly. And um, obviously... 
speaking his pigeon English, his recounting of the story is more along the lines of, oh, he hurt, he fell off ladder. He tried to see girl. He tried to see room. Tried to see in room to see girl. She make him crazy. Which... Yeah, which which really, when you... Yeah, that is the situation. But obviously, Sybil's read into it that he's crazy about this woman and fancies her, and that's why he's up the ladder. Yeah, and she's marching out straight away, and you know, you know, the battle's for it at this point. Yeah. I like a woman with spirits. Oh, do you? Is that what you like? I do, I do! So, just as he's propping up the ladder again, and it looks like he's going to have a second attempt at the right window, uh, Sybil just comes along and slaps him to the ground, effectively. She belts him to the ground. Yeah. He, I mean, he does a comedy fall. But as he gets up, the way he says, What the... <laughs> he's so confused as to what's going on. Yeah. It's palpable, isn't it? We can feel how just completely yeah. baffled he is. So he chases Sybil inside and sort of chases her up and tries to confront her. He gets another slap because he says, I was trying to see the girl, is that so strange? That's it. He doesn't do himself any favours by not explaining the full story. Because he's almost like gaslighting her, isn't he, that, that nothing's happened because she, she's obviously cross and I don't get why he doesn't know. But obviously it's that Manuel's mm. told her the story um, as best he could and, it, and yeah, of course, of course she's cross. I also think in a real world, you would credit Sybil with the intelligence to work it out. Yeah. Basil just thinks she's gone mad. Yes. And and <laughs> poor Manuel's trying to sympathise with Basil. And he just says, oh, she got crazy. <laughs> she's gone completely mad. Crazy. She got crazy. I mean, crazy. I, I say to her, you try to see in girl's room, has she got crazy? <laughs> You got to see girl in room. You crazy about this girl, okay? Okay, so you go out to try to look at her, and Mrs. Faulty, she go crazy. I love that. So when Basil realizes that Manuel has miscommunicated the problem to crowbar in the title of the last episode, yes, he picks him up and wiggles him about a bit. He does shakes him. Yeah, that'll learn him. Yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll teach you to open your mouth. And then uh, we have Basil needlessly fall through the doorway into the abbot's room. Oh, God, Don't know yeah. what that was. One one slapstick too many, possibly, I think. But um, mm-hmm. there's loads of more awkward sex references because Basil's hearing them everywhere at this point. Everything he says, he's like, don't mis- misconstrue that is basically yeah. the way his brain's working. And then uh, I think we're in the next morning at this point, aren't we? Yes, where, where, yeah. Where Basil's sort of still... He sat on the landing. All night, yeah. it looks like he's been sat waiting to pounce in case somebody comes out of Mr. Johnson's bedroom. Yeah, but you think if he's been... If the walls are so thin he can hear them joking, what what else has he heard been sat there all night? Oh, dear. You know what I mean? He's, he's loitering. Polly comes up with Sybil's breakfast, which Basil actually uses to, to worm his way back into Sybil's room and make his yes. excuses. Mm. She doesn't want to see him, though. She's not interested. No. She doesn't believe them at all, like you say, and um, that just further convinces Basil that he needs to catch the perpetrators to prove yeah. his prove his innocence in the matter. Yes, yeah, to make it look like he's not crazy. We get a brief uh, view of the of the abbots at this point going out of the hotel, saying to each other, "There's enough material there for an entire conference." <laughs> God, I bet they were rubbing their hands together, weren't they? <laughs> so at this point is when Basil finds his way into the wardrobe and sort of. I don't know, I think he was planning on just hiding in the wardrobe and springing them when they came out of the room. Yeah. Uh, it's a cleaning cupboard, isn't it? Not a wardrobe, a cleaning yeah, closet. It's, yeah, and it, he ends up with, like, dirt or soot all over his hands. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was, like, shoe polish. He never actually clarifies what it is. No, but his, his hands are filthy. Yeah, a little bit clumsy in terms of exposition because you just, what is this? But never yeah. mind. He hides in the cupboard, determined to catch them. But instead, the person here is coming out of the room to... Turns out not to be Johnson and the girl. It's it's Raylene, the Australian girl. Raylene. Raylene. Yeah, I think it is more Raylene. It's almost like um. Raylene. The you remember those fake Australian female names that Flight of the Concords came up with? Yes. Keitha. I think it's... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what was the other one? I don't think was she. I don't think she was Australian. I think she was she was American. Bra. Bra- it was Barbara. <laughs> Barbara, Barbara, yeah, Barbara. Christian Wig, Barbara. I like the Australian girl though. I know this is the wrong sitcom. We're now deep diving, but where she says to Jermaine, "Oh, my granddad met me granny." Well, I say met me raped her. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's awful. awful, but you can't help laughing at the way they're just making jokes oh. of of the convicts of Australia. Yeah, Keitha. Yeah. Anyway, let's leave Keitha in two thousand and seven. Where yeah. she is, leave her there. Yeah. He bundles out the cleaning closet and grabs this Australian girl. Rally. Thank you. <laughs> it's the same as Mr. Wolf. I just can't retain the name. <laughs> Mr. Wolf. And and Sybil sees this, and of course, she comes along. And Basil's got the black hand, and the and Raylene's got the the big black paw print on her right tit. Yes. But weirdly, Aww. when Basil sees this, what does he do? Grabs it again. I mean, there's no excuse a second time round, is there? No, no. He should be on the list. He should. So Basil comes back up to apologise to the girl, lets himself into her room without knocking, and she's in her underwear. Mm. So he dives down the side of the bed to hide and then hides in the wardrobe when there's a knock on the door, which is yes. which is Sybil, again, being very reasonable to Raylene and, and apologising for Basil's behaviour. But just as she's about to leave, she spots Basil's finger, <laughs> which is quite funny. His fingers are sticking <laughs> just out a little of finger the hanging out of the wardrobe. And he's checking the door. He's checking the hinges in the doors. Oh, God. She's very cutting at this point. She says, do you really imagine even in your wildest dreams that a girl like this could possibly be interested in an ageing stick insect like you? Oh. And at this point, Cleese was 39. <laughs> God. I mean, he was only 35 when they were filming the first series. When I, when you think, when I think about that, because obviously as a kid, they seemed like the ultimate grown-ups. Mm. Well, mm. and now, do, do you know what I mean? Though they were they were adults when I was a, when I was a child, and now looking at them as younger than me, it does feel it feels weird. When when Sybil was in hospital the other week, and it said that she was like thirty four or thirty five on the on oh, did it? the list. Yeah, where her name was in her room, I mean, she was either thirty four or thirty six, I think. But even that made me think, blimey, that's just as a kid, I would that that seemed like ancient. This couple in the mid mid thirties are running mid thirties, yeah. A, a hotel in Torquay, blimey. yeah. Different, different. It's a bit yeah. like when we looked at Tom Good having his mortgage paid off. Yeah, it's just, just, it just highlights how fucked our kids' generation are. I don't know what I'm laughing. It's not funny. Yeah, but they really are. Basil actually gives up his lies and tries to come clean for a second time in this episode, but Sybil won't have it. So in the hall, Basil chases her down, and he's had enough, and he just says, "Shut up" to her, doesn't he? Yeah, he's quite rude to her, isn't he, in this scene? I'm fed up of you, you rancorous, quaffered old sow. <laughs> that's that's cutting, that, isn't it? That's really that's cutting. Superb. Oh, Why don't you dear. syringe the donuts out of your ear and get some sense into the dormant organ you keep hidden in that rat's maze of yours? <laughs> Excellent. Blimey, he's had, that, he's had that stored up, I think, hasn't he? But he decides he's going to prove to her once and for all that he is innocent of any sort of wrongdoing here and he's just trying to yes. catch Mr. Johnson and the um, illicit yeah. lady that he's smuggled in. So he knocks on Mr. Johnson's door to call him out directly, as, of course, he should have done in the first place. Day one. That should have been his first part of call. Mr. Johnson says, Mrs. Johnson's in here, yes? Yeah, so you'd assume that was his wife, wouldn't you? You'd assume that his wife was there. Yeah, well, he says, well, I thought you were unmarried. He said, well, it's my mother. Yeah. And, and Basil mm-hmm. thinks this is hysterical. Oh, old Mother Johnson's popped up for a quickie, did she? <laughs> <laughs> I should have guessed. Oh, yes, of course. The little woman, eh? The only thing is, I, I thought you told my wife that you were single. I am. I see. So who's this Mrs Johnson, then? The late president's wife, or...? <laughs> She's my mother. Your mother? Oh, I see. This, uh, bit of crumpets, your old mummy, is she? <laughs> Oh, this is rich. Oh, 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 Mother Johnson popped up for a quickie, did she? May I meet her? Certainly. Mother Johnson, Mother Johnson, come out, come out, wherever you are. How do you do? Are you enjoying your stay? <laughs> so he says, come out, come out, wherever you are, which she does, and he immediately, he handles it quite well, actually. He's like, oh, I hope you're enjoying your stay. <laughs> he snaps back, and that, that's the bit about his sort of mental illness, I suppose, the way that he approaches things, the way that he can just mask it he can mask all the manicness and go back to be really like a reasonable person mm. in in the blink of an eye but then that takes similarly in the blink of an eye as soon as they go back in the room <laughs> yeah. he's back to being an absolute fucking start raving bonkers mental patient isn't he 
because he covers his head with his arms and starts sort of frog yeah. hopping around the, around the hall. Around the floor, yeah. Quite weird, really. But as he's doing that, the psychiatrist and his wife come up, and I'm sure that the last line they say is, Bank holiday. <laughs> Bank holiday. I haven't got anything like that written down, no. They just say they just say one one or two words, and I'm sure it's like bank holiday. Okay. And I just thought, what? It was a bit like that scene where the wedding party come in and they go, we've been to a wedding. We've been to a wedding? Yeah, and then it finishes. Yeah, very odd. I'll probably be corrected because I'm always making mistakes. I'm so... I'm all, Honestly, I, every time I do a social media post for, for Sado these days, I do something wrong. And then somebody picks me up on it and I feel like a tit. <laughs> No, I don't feel like a tape because we ask people to do that, don't we? And I think that's that's cool. As long as people are constructive and not mean, it's all good. I think it just means I need to get more sleep. Maybe that's what it means, yeah. <laughs> that's all it means. So for me, this one was a bit much frenetic pace, full of misunderstandings. But like you, I thought if we were doing MVP, it would be Sybil. Yeah, surprisingly, I was. Yeah, it took me by surprise how I warmed to her in this episode, and it must have been written that way. It must have been written to for you to feel some kind of sympathy and empathy for for Sybil. Perhaps, but I think one of the reasons I didn't enjoy it as much was perhaps it was lacking in the other characters. There wasn't much Polly or Manuel or yeah, that's true. J- J- Jacko in the kitchen. I, I've I've got a question. Um, yeah. So Mother Johnson. Yeah. How did Mother Johnson get in the room if Basil had been sat on the landing all night? Did you climb up the ladder? I think it's just projection that we th- we think he was set, sat there all night. He would have had to... Okay. He probably would have passed out or... But if the doors are locked, how's he got his bit of stuff out and Miss and Mrs Johnson in? Oh, yeah. Hold on. I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation. Okay. I'm thinking, probably th- overthinking it. If you look at the goofs, there's also the case that when, when Raylene's checking in... Mm-hmm. Have I said her name wrong? No, Raleen. Oh, I think I'll go. That's right. That's right. When, when, when she's checking in, Sybil appears from, I think, the left-hand side where she couldn't possibly have been because she walked off in like okay. in the same scene the other way. Mm. So maybe um, there's a teleportation device in the kitchen. Maybe that's what it is. Jacko invented. <laughs> that's the answer. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Glad to have helped. Did you pick out any bric-a-brac this week, Al? Um, I did. It's quite. It's quite a straightforward piece of bric-a-brac, really. It was the pigeonholes behind the counter. Which oh you yeah. yeah. You yeah. don't see them anymore in hotels because they just get robbed. Um, cause That's they'd true. They put keys in there, and you'd, you'd, if you got any posts, posts sent to a hotel. I suppose if you were like away for two weeks and you, I don't know, maybe someone would send you something important. It would be put in your in your pigeonhole. Well, um, one of the guests had a had a letter, a letter. there. It, yeah. Yeah. In um, in the wedding party. It was. And something's like been sent for you, and that's waiting for you. They put it into your room's cubby hole. But no, they're not. They're not really a thing anymore. But I do remember going away to like Bournemouth or Torquay as a kid, and then being that's where your key was hung on a like a, like a little hook. Hmm. I uh, struggled a bit. <laughs> did you? Did you pick? Did you pick anything? I fell asleep again. <laughs> well, I was going to pick the ink stamp, which I noticed. Right. But I, I thought you do get you do still get ink stamps. It's just that. Yeah. So I don't really think it's necessarily representative of the time. So instead I went for the light switches, which I noticed in previous episodes are very much those old yes. style of light switches. With a ball on the end. Yeah, which perhaps, um, I don't know, because I've not inspected one for, for many a year, but perhaps it's nip- nipula-like. Yeah. Perhaps it's got areola qualities to it, which um, yeah. explain Basil's misunderstanding with the Australian girl's ample bosom. Perhaps. Perhaps, yeah, they are of, of a time, aren't they? They're quite like an early 1900s hangover. I, I quite I like them. Yeah. I mean, I prefer one that you can dim. I do. There's a definite action needed with a with one of them. Yeah, well, the, the, the dimmer ones go from side to side. That would have helped Basil more, wouldn't it? Yeah. But yes, um, there we go. A bit of bric-a-brac. Not a bit thin on bric-a-brac this week, though. Well, let's hope mm. for something special next week. Next week's episode, in fact, is Waldorf Salad. It is. I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah, I think that'll be a good one because the American in it is is more than Faulty's match in terms of being obnoxious. Yes. He's really aggressive, isn't he? And quite mm. deranged in his own right. Yeah, I think the psychiatrists will probably be glad that they didn't stop that weekend. Oh, Christ, yeah. Imagine, imagine they were all there together. Like, um, <laughs> like a big 
bonus yeah. big bonus episode where they're all just in there together. Well, we talked to Stephen Hall last week who played mm. Basil in um, in the Australian stage show that John Cleese wrote. And that was a, a sort of mashup of three episodes. And, I mean, these episodes on their own are frenetic and, and pacey and crazy. Can you imagine mm. all three bundled into one stage play? Would it be too, I think it'd be too much. I think I would, I'd struggle with that mania, that level of mania. Well, certainly from an act, actor's point of view, yeah. I mean, yeah. must have been exhausting. Mm. But uh, if you haven't listened to that episode, it's a bonus episode that came out last week. By the time this one comes out, it would be two weeks ago, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but he's he, a, was, he, he sounded lovely. He sounded really interesting. Yeah, yeah, lovely guy and very humble. Mm. But, um, yeah, a multi-talented guy who's really good to talk to. So give that one a listen. Let's have a trip over to uh, Fashion Corner. I know we've done it the wrong way around. We don't usually introduce the, the next episode until we've done Fashion That's Corner. Right. But never Mix mind. It up. Mix it up. Yeah, I'm being contrary. Yeah. Well, there we go. Well, well it's, it's time, time to take a little trip, trip to the place that long ago was hip. It's Fashion Corner. It's Fashion Corner. It's Fashion Corner. Fashion Corner. So the opener for me in Fashion Corner this week was, of course, Mr. Johnson when he arrives in his flared leather trousers. I think they were... I, I, thought, I couldn't make out whether they were leather or pleather. It's always difficult to tell, isn't it, without feeling? I know. I don't. I, I wouldn't want to touch his pants, though, I don't think. No. Um, That's for unistubs only. It is. Open shirt, open neck shirt, medallions are plenty. I think there was, a, there was um, an Egyptian fertility symbol that I think he bought in, like, Colchester or somewhere. And... Uh, I think a, a shark tooth or some kind of a rhino. Horn. There was some kind of animal. Yeah, rhino horn. I think he said. Yeah, was it a rhino or Sybil horn? said. Yeah. Oh, see, so all all these medallions were leading towards the sexuality of this of this man in leather trousers. Next up, we have the arrival of Rylane with her mint green top. Like you said, it was very booby. It was a very mm. booby top, and and. I, you could, you could sort of clock faulty looking looking down quite often to, to check it out. Um, admiring her necklace, he said, when actually he was just getting an eyeful of her chest. But the, the, yeah, the mint green top that she had on was lovely. It was very, very pretty. Mm-hmm. She, she'd sort of paired that with a flowery skirt. Doctor, Mrs. Dr. Abbott. So that's the way around, isn't it? Dr. Mrs. Abbott? No, that's, the missus. Yeah, it must be the first way around, yeah. The missus of the doctors. When they are, I think they're heading out, and she's got like a brown spotted blouse on with a, a peachy, rusty coloured um, skirt suit. But it was it was really lovely, and the the the, the colour of the skirt and the the jacket matched the spots in the in the blouse that she had on top. Uh, we see quite a lot of browns sort of in the in the seventies, but this I think it looked it looked quite modern. I think you, you I looked at that suit and thought that would I, I could I'd, I'd, I'd happily wear that. Would you tell Sybil to wear it? Like, like I wouldn't. Basil no, did. no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Sybil's got her own style. Leave it to it. Exactly, exactly. Um, when Faulty tries to get back into the bedroom of Sybil to try and get explain himself and get back on a, in, in a good box, she's obviously just got up and she's got like a headscarf on. I think it's like a pink headscarf, bright, shocking pink headscarf, and a black sheer nighty, and she looks quite cute and. We don't often see Sybil looking like that because she's usually all buttoned up and uh, in their single beds. She looked, but so she'd spent the night on her own and, and looked quite sexy. Yeah. Make of that what you will. Maybe a little reminder had gone off. Yeah, maybe she'd set a <laughs> Google. Alarm. Yeah, she had one of them toothbrushes from the seventies in there. <laughs> she did. <laughs> um, and we see her later on, and she's got she, she had quite a few costume changes in this episode. Did um, Prudella Scales. Um, she's now in a in a white and red spotty dress with a with jacket. It might have been a top and a skirt with a jacket, um, with white piping around the outside. This was quite cute as well. She looked like Minnie Mouse esque in this. I thought it looked I quite thought. severe with all the piping. Yeah, it, it was it was it was it was nice, and it was it was quite it, it seemed different to what she normally wears because she normally wears quite a lot of muted colours like blues and browns and greens. But this red was quite, it was quite striking what she had on. Quite formal, obviously it was part of her, her working uniform, but I thought she looked quite, she looked quite cute. And I think that's everything this week that I've got. So if you're enjoying what we're doing, you can follow us at Saddle Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. We post a lot of rare photos and videos on there from Faulty Towers and from The Good Life and from much, much more. 
We've got a Facebook page that you can find by searching Saddle Podcast. And we also have a growing Facebook group that you can join. And you can contribute to it with discussions and memes and rarities that you might find yourself. You can also vote for the subject matter of the forthcoming third series, which will be later this year, when we could do with them as soon as really. So if you've got any ideas that you want to let us know about, please just drop us a line. Somebody said after Henry because of the... Oh, yeah. I'd quite like that because she Would won't you? be all what, what. Yeah, I think she's, she's, and, she's and still several. quite a severe character, I think, but I don't think she's as what, what in that. No, I don't know. I'm not so big on the old ITV sitcoms other than Rising Damp. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe. We'll put it to the vote. It won't be up to us. We'll just make a shortlist. Exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm looking forward to what people suggest. Subscribe to our newsletter by visiting our website, sado.club, where you can also get more information about us, read the blogs, share us a coffee, and listen to the episodes if you don't do podcast apps. Uh, you can also watch original episodes on there um, and have a look at our good life quiz, which you can take part in. Get in touch, email us at saddlepodcast at gmail.com and subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from. We haven't um, given a shout out to the the wonderful Rusty Rockets or Anya for allowing us to use their caricatures on our website and social media headers. So once again, thank you to both of those people. If you, uh, if you like Rusty Rockets, is that his name, Rusty Rockets? I don't know. It's not, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thanking some rando. Hold on. He sounds like someone I follow on on Twitter, Rusty Rockets, and he's more. I think that's like... I think that's Russell Brand, isn't it? I think that's Russell Brand. Rusty Rockets, it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Russell Brand. God, he's multi talented, isn't he? Russell Brand, he does a bit of everything. For, Rusty he's Rockets. busy organising the socialist uprising, doing a bit yes, of comedy and a bit of acting, and then doing doodles for podcasts. Yeah. Right. Yeah, do that again. Don't put that in. I think I might just leave it in. <laughs> Ru- Rust- the fucker's name's Rusty Doodles, right? Thank you, <laughs> Rusty, Rusty Doodles. Rockets. Rusty Doodles. That- I told you I'm getting things wrong all the time. I need I need a good light night's kip is what I need. Oh, Rusty Doodles. He is selling caricatures and they're all very good. I'm sure Russell Brand is not a patch on <laughs> Rusty Rockets. So check out his um, online shop if you if you feel like buying some mugs or t shirts or whatever. Fab, yeah, thanks guys. Final word just on the sad passing of John Chalice that we um we heard about today and the day that we're recording. He was obviously a brilliant comedy actor in sitcoms like Only Fools and Horses, so he'll be sadly missed. He will. I saw, an, I saw an advert yesterday as well from um, 1986, which was an advert that he starred in for some... Um, it was it was um, tea. It was some tea advert in, in the UK that I remembered. And it was a mad earworm. I remembered the whole advert from like line by line when I, when I saw it. And, and it, he's in it, is he? Is he playing Boise? He's Boise-y? in it, yeah. Yeah. He's not Boise, but he's like a Boise-style lechy character in it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was a bit typecast, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> But yeah, God love him. Yeah. So we'll see you next week for Series 2, Episode 3, Waldorf Salad. Marlene? quite good actually wasn't it I didn't know I could do that that's a new string to my bow <laughs> go add that to your CV oh, do you know I'll never yeah. stop doing that now <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>